Well, recently, I was at NASA in California checking out a space telescope that's got astronomers extremely excited. Indeed, they're waxing lyrical about it. It's looking for twin Earths. If you want to get a feel for just how special planet Earth is, take a look at the place next door. Pretty bleak, unless frozen Martian deserts are your thing. Or visit the planet on the other side, Venus. It's so hot here, lead, zinc and tin would all melt. There's nowhere in the solar system remotely like our planet. Makes you wonder, are there other Earths out there? People have been pondering the question for centuries. But now, for the first time, we've got a chance of answering it. For the last three years, NASA's had a telescope orbiting in space, looking for other Earths. They've started finding some exciting results. We went off to NASA's Ames Laboratories in Silicon Valley, which are the home of this Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler is uh, funded by NASA to answer one very specific question, and that is, what fraction of stars in our galaxy harbor planets that are like Earth in size and potentially habitable? One of the most exciting science experiments going on today, in my mind, is the Kepler mission. It's the Columbus, it's the Armstrong step on the moon uh, for our first steps out into the galaxy. The plan to look for other Earths in the galaxy began a long time ago. And so starting in 1984, I started trying to put that idea into practice. How would we actually implement that? After all, finding tiny planets in the vastness of space would be an enormous challenge. Eight years later, the Kepler telescope was proposed to NASA. They rejected it in 92, 94, 96, 98. So year after year, we would go back and show that we could do all these things. Kepler finally got the go ahead to build in 2000. This is the instrument the researchers worked on to develop Kepler. It's basically a replica of the space telescope. They shone artificial starlight up from the bottom through the telescope to the detectors at the top. Now, here's the thing. They showed they could detect variations in starlight of 10 parts per million. Incredible accuracy, but just what you need to detect Earth-sized planets orbiting other stars. The reason such extreme light sensitivity is needed is because of the way planets are detected. The Kepler spacecraft is actually orbiting the sun, staring at one patch of the galaxy continuously. It watches thousands of stars to see if any of those stars dim a little bit as an Earth-like planet crosses in front, blocks a little of the starlight, dimming the star. And so we watch for stars that dim over and over and over again. The star dims by 1%, that planet's the size of Jupiter. If it dims by a tenth that, size of Neptune, a hundredth that, that's an Earth-sized planet. At last, in 2009, Kepler was in space. And almost immediately we got a stream of data coming down. Oh, it's just a wonderful feeling, an elation, you know. You're sort of walking on clouds because of all these years, 30 years or more, of putting this together, it works. Big planets are easiest to find because they block the most starlight. But excitingly, Earth-sized ones have started being detected, like Kepler 20e. Yeah, Kepler 20e is orbiting very close to the star, so this whole star-facing side is just extremely hot. Um, what you're seeing is, is literally a, uh, a lava world, right, where one side is, is molten because of those very high temperatures. And the other side is cold. The other side can be very cold. It depends on the exact orbital dynamics. It's a really wacky world by the sounds of it. It is, that's exactly yeah. right, yeah. So wacky, 22E may be Earth-sized, but hardly Earth-like. But Kepler 22B is more interesting. It's not too close to its sun, nor too far away. You want the place that's between fire and ice the Goldilocks zone, where we think life could evolve. In the Goldilocks zone, the amount of sunshine hitting the planet is just right. That's going to dictate the surface temperature of the planet, and the surface temperature is important because it tells us whether or not liquid water could pool on the surface. Liquid water is the key because it makes the chemistry of life work. Liquid water takes ordinary carbon-based molecules, ethane, methane, that sort of thing, 
amino acids, breaks them apart into the carbon atoms, the hydrogen atoms, the oxygen atoms. And once broken apart, those atoms can reassemble into new, more complex hydrocarbons. And complex hydrocarbons are the basis of life. Astronomers are keen to learn just how Earth-like Kepler-22b is. But it's in the habitable zone. If there's a surface on it, uh, the temperature is pretty much like that of Earth, but a little bit warmer. It'd be a little bit more pleasant there. Of course, it might be a water world, or it might be a gas world. We're not sure. And so this summer, we're trying to make more measurements from ground-based telescopes to see if it has a rocky core or not. But maybe we go there and you find all the life is that is there are fish and whales. Kepler is homing in on its goal measuring the percentage of stars that have Earth-like planets. We'll probably tell you, look, it's going to be somewhere between maybe 0.01% and a, a few percent, OK? Nobody knows yet. But if, if that range is correct, it still means there are hundreds of millions of habitable planets at least. And that's just in our galaxy. If for some reason our galaxy doesn't measure up to your demanding needs for habitability, you know, there are 150 billion other galaxies we can see. So uh, there's plenty of real estate. Kepler's incredible observations are making our vast universe seem a little friendlier.